Hello, and welcome to the LifeWorks podcast. Joining me today is Bob Pearson, an expert in the areas of communication, marketing, social and digital media, as well as current and future trends in all of those areas. He's the author of four books, including his latest, Crafting Persuasion. He currently serves as Senior Technology Advisor to the State Department's Global Engagement Center, whose mission is to help the federal government recognize, understand, expose, and counter foreign state and non-state propaganda and disinformation efforts aimed at undermining or influencing the policies, security, or stability of the United States and its allies. Bob, it is an honor to have you on the podcast today. Mark, I always enjoy speaking with you, so I'm looking forward to it. Thank you. The reason why I wanted to have you on today, Bob, is we live in the most connected time in our history with mobile devices, search, mainstream and alternative media, social media, streaming and gaming. People's access to information, content and news uh, is unprecedented. In addition, the barrier to entry to creating and publish content is, is also perhaps the lowest it's ever been. However, it's become increasingly difficult for regular folks to be able to distinguish trustworthy information from misinformation or disinformation. So what I'm hoping you can do is to help me and our audience to understand what misinformation and disinformation is, how to identify it, techniques for thinking critically, and where to find good and reliable information. Like I mentioned in the intro, you have an incredible professional background and I feel that no introduction that I can give can really do you justice. T tell me a little bit more about your backstory. Yeah, so, and by the way, uh, when I talk about disinformation, I have to put in the caveat mark that these are my own views as a citizen, I'm not representing any one Oh, entity. thank you, thank you, of you know course. No, I have to do that. Yeah, I, I, <laughs> you. I, you know, I grew up as a communicator, so I um, uh, early on became responsible for global international uh, communication departments. Um, in the pharmaceutical industry and then the technology industry. And really what that taught me is how do human beings behave? How do content news cycles occur? How does information move across 10, 20, 30 countries? And so you're not only doing that and trying to promote things, but you're also looking at issues and understanding how issues emerge. So what I didn't realize at the time is I was, I was learning a lot about human behavior. Wow. And then when you look at, at technology and when, you know, we started to get social media and the ability to build algorithms, we started to be able to put the two together and say, okay, we have a pretty good gut feel of how humans work. Now we can actually build algorithms and actually see exactly how they really do work. Oh. And so you can wow. see who's influencing who, how they get influenced, how, you know, what's the elasticity of content, how it moves along. And, and th those are extremely valuable skills for all of us, uh, not only to protect our, our country or our communities or companies, but also how to understand how bad actors work. Because really they, they do the same thing we do, they just do them in a way that we don't like. You know, right? <laughs> right. So right. we have to be as smart as they are or smarter so we can we can out, out, out maneuver. Yeah. So that's a little bit of my background. And I think so I think, you know, yes, I have a lot of jobs and things I've done, but it comes down to understanding human behavior, understanding how communication works, you know, and, and then going from there. Wow, that's fascinating. At a very foundational level, what's the difference between misinformation and disinformation? Yeah, that's uh, a great question. And I think people confuse the two. And let's start with disinformation. Uh, disinformation is uh, a tool to uh, use no different than uh, uh, cyber warfare, or you could even argue, you know, those who want to instigate uh, problems around the world. If you look at Russia, Russia uses disinformation like asymmetric warfare. You know, they, they are really looking at how to desensitize entire populations around the, country, around the world over time. So we don't know what's right and what's wrong. That's, that's their, one of their ways of, of building power. You know, if we look at China, China is much more methodical. They're more like a big consumer package goods company. They know exactly what they're doing to tell the world, this is our version of the truth. We believe that's disinformation in many cases, not always, but many cases, but they're very clear about it. That's different than misinformation where people are just 
you know, quite frankly, that could be a, a bias that people have. Yeah. It could be uh, way too opinionated. It could be a group that just hates another group mm. and is just throwing stuff out. It could be people throwing out mini hoaxes. Um, they're, they're looking to misinform, very dangerous. But disinformation, I see, is something that is really um, methodical and consistent and has a purpose, where misinformation is more episodic often. Can you give us some examples of misinformation and disinformation that you've seen? Yeah, sure. So again, start with disinfo. I mean, when you look at COVID-19 and um, when it first started, at the end of March, the Kremlin had already put out over 110 disinformation campaigns. Uh, and, and really, their attitude is like, let's just throw, they just throw stuff out through third parties, you know. Wow. Uh, Bill Gates created, you know, the problem, or this was really, it's really occurred in a U.S. laboratory, or, and, and they know the majority of people in the world will know that that's BS, but they, but they know there's a certain number of people that go, maybe, maybe there is something here. So it's, it's the volume of information that they push out. So it's not a disinformation campaign. It is a campaign to disinform. It's a very different thing. That's one versus hundreds, right? So uh, misinformation, it, it, you could, it, it runs the gamut. I mean, you have, again, this could be those who want to create mischief. This happened in Texas where there was um, a, 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 a person who was setting off uh, bombs a, mm. a couple years ago. And immediately people rode the wave, those who wanted to misinform, and said that this was a racist activity. Yeah. So, of course, without any other information, people assume that. You don't really know the answer until months later, but people are interjecting stuff in there to misinform hoping that people will go in a, a different direction. And that, that's easy to see. The question is, um, do we put in place the right mechanisms to just you know, tell people what's really going on? For someone like Russia or China, maybe more specifically, what's their long-term goal in putting out these disinformation campaigns? Yeah, I mean, it's, you know, I think it's important when you look at other parties to not just go negative, but to think positive too. You know, like you always want to think like them and then, then go back. So China's goal is they want to be number one in the world and everything. So on its face, what's wrong with that? Every country can has the right to decide that they want to become number one in something. Right. It's how they go about doing it. And so, mm -hmm. um, you know, so if you think of like, go back to COVID, a very simple example. I don't think anyone would say, gee, they've been really upfront and transparent about what happened in Wuhan. <laughs> I mean, no one's saying that, right? right. So. There's a, I think what, the way I would look at it is if you want to be the best in the world, there's an obligation to also be transparent and honest and open. And, and those things go together, at least yeah. our view of the world. Right. They don't have that view of the world. And so it's, it's okay for them to disinform and to tell a narrative that we know is not true, but they believe it's part of getting to the right place, which is leadership in the world. That's totally different, like I was saying, like with Russia, Russia doesn't aspire to be number one in the world. Russia just aspires to have power and to keep everyone on base. You know, and, and, and they, you know, there's lots of examples there. What kind of tactics do they use? Like how do bad actors spread information and, and who are they targeting? Yeah, so you go back to like election interference and you know, we, I think, woke up here in the US and said, oh my goodness, the election might've been interfered with. Well. What we're, we need to get better at doing is understanding patterns before that stuff like that happens. Because if you looked at Russia trying to interfere with elections, you could find maybe 20 plus examples in different countries that where they were experimenting for years before they came and used some of those similar tactics in the United States. So really, I, this is where I look at the media and say, we, we need more journalists or we need, we need more curious journalists. Because if you actually look back enough, you'd say, oh, this is pretty obvious what they were doing in Europe, in Eurasia, in, uh, in the Middle East, in the Balkans. Right. And now they're just using the same techniques against us. So um, it, it's very rare that bad actors do something that's that innovative that we haven't seen it before. <laughs> right. It's a matter of us looking backwards and understanding the patterns. The other thing is they use, you know, they use proxy networks really well. So if you think on the positive side, mm -hmm. Amazon.com uses proxy networks. We just call them affiliates. Right, right. right. They just they, they want all these people out there talking about their products to drive people into Amazon so they can actually sell more on Amazon. It works really well. 
Well, if you're Russia, you want all these people to actually be basically selling your content by moving it and, and, and actually uh, pushing people towards a certain direction. So it's basically an affiliate program. <laughs> and we, you know, wow. and, and, so, and I think that's important. Like if you, if you look at like, you know, what's happening commercially, it's innovative. And you look at what bad actors are doing that's innovative. There, there's often, they're pretty darn close. Yeah, yeah. I, I've heard you talk about a one nine ninety model for influence. I want to I want to pull what you, a thread on what you just said about that, but I want to bring in a, a talk that you've given in the past related to that. Can you, for our audience, can you tell us a little bit about what the one nine ninety model is? Yeah. Well, if you go back to what I was saying about you know studying human behavior, one of the things we've seen in the media anywhere in the world where you have enough media is that less than 1% of people are prolific content creators. And you can see exactly who they are. That 9% of us like to share content to inform our communities. We want to, uh, we want to inform, we want to educate, we want to solve problems. And then 90% of us lurk and learn. We don't do anything. We passively consume uh, search content, social media content, and we're cool with that. So the 1% are easy to see because they're very prolific. They could be journalists, bloggers, they could be anyone. Yeah. The 90 the 90% is over here. The 9% we forget about. And that's that's what proxy networks haven't forgotten about. Because they're like, okay, if I can identify the people who are most likely to move my content, a lot of them will move it for free because they don't like the people that we're going against. Others, maybe we give them a little bit of money and then they move it, mm -hmm. right? On the positive side, if we actually do the same thing, we have a lot more good people in the world than there are bad actors. So if we actually get better at using these techniques to put content out with the right keywords, we can actually bury the negative information coming from Russia and other places like that. So wow. but that, takes, that takes teamwork across not only the public sector, but also the private sector. Tell us a little bit about the disinformation landscape today. Yeah. So in that, I, you know, I, I like looking at things that are as quantitative as possible. And so I actually now go out of disinformation and go into counterfeiting and illegal drugs. Oh, wow. So the counterfeiting industry, by the way, they use the same techniques, same tools, same platforms, sometimes even the same people, right? Wow. Because you make money and you fund other causes that you, that, where you can't make money. The, the counterfeiting industry worldwide is about a half a trillion dollars. And that's, that's what we, that's like a conservative estimate. And then the illegal drug trade, we know it's, it's very easy to move drugs online. So when you do that, we, we've actually just studied that recently. It's not hard at all to bring illegal drugs into the US, it's not hard to bring counterfeit in here. And what you see is that the people are, they're using message platforms well, they're using the dark web well, they're using ghost accounts on Instagram, they're you know, seeding content in the infrastructure. So the kind of thing that they do is, you know, if you look at how they work, like they, I would say uh, in a message platform, hey, Mark, go to Instagram account X. And you would go there and you'd see a phone number, but like no post. It's a ghost account. You, you, hit, you hit that number, you're now in another message platform and we're saying, okay, here's what we need you to do. Oh, wow. And then you go public and you start doing it. So we have to be better at understanding what people do when they go into uh, encrypted places. And, and or we have to get better at scraping the dark web and then looking at the behavior of people when they go public, right? Because if we're just looking at people going public, we're missing a lot of how bad actors work. So that you can learn from the drug industry and the cannabis industry. And you know that bad actors do the same thing when they're trying to disinform us. It really seems that disinformation is extraordinarily pervasive. Is there disinformation in the mainstream media? It could be misinformation, mm -hmm. but it's certainly biased. I think, yeah. you know, and Mark, you know, you and I have talked about this before where the, the personalization of news matters so much. So this is the thing that, it doesn't bother me. It's it just, it is what it is. Right. When I ask uh, university students where they get their news, it's social media. I don't have anyone raise their hand and say they're reading two newspapers a day. Um, <laughs> it, it just, I yeah. didn't run into them, you know? And, and so what you then say is like, okay, but who are they trusting? And so I think that the journalists have an obligation to, to get out of their comfortable areas and actually get on social media and engage with people directly. 
Yeah. And I think we'll have much better dialogues and people will, will respect them more. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I, I believe that the future of the newsroom, a lot of that potential is outside the newsroom. You know, and when you, when you look at worldwide and you say, where do most people get their content? It's through two companies. It's through Facebook and Google. How do we identify reliable information? It's a lot of people trying to do that. And, you know, whether it's fact checking, which has not proven to be very successful. Yeah. Uh, there's blockchain exercises, has nothing there that's that successful so far. I would say, you know, there's people putting up alternative content, you know, so you can have a choice. I don't think most of that works well. And um, no. there's a reason for it is, you know, you've talked with Victoria Romero before, mm -hmm. and who's a psych psychological expert, and you think of availability bias. So what's happening is, you know, people get locked into usually not more than four channels a day mm -hmm. being apps or mainstream media outlets. And they're, they're just consuming from the same place. So they start to believe whatever they're hearing in that screen is true. So if yeah. we're going to now tell them that this fact is wrong or here's an alternative source, their instinct is that can't be true. Mm. It's not, oh, good, someone's informing me. I can get educated. So yeah. we have to get that kind of out of our head. Right. And what people need is who do they trust? that could actually mm -hmm. speak to them. And that gets into understanding influence. So if I'm trying to reach a group of 100,000 people that are going the wrong direction, who do they trust? How do I influence them? Mm -hmm. And how do I reshape that dialogue so it actually impacts them for the long term? And that's one of the concepts that we call audience architecture. So instead of taking content and pushing it out and then praying that people will get the right story, that's mm -hmm. not going to work. We have to say, what is that audience ecosystem now? Who do they care about? And then how do we influence that? And yeah. so I think we can do it. We're totally capable of doing it. But it's a, it's a mindset shift in how we shape behavior. Mm -hmm. If we were to try to do an influence campaign you know, for, for, for good, <laughs> using our powers yeah. for good, yeah. how, would you, how would you architect that? Yeah. So let's, let's, let's say you um, let's say we're in Europe and we're looking at anti-Semitism, you know, and we have 30 groups that we know uh, are, are doing it. Well, one of them is, first of all, I would say, let's, let's all agree to share uh, keywords. Mm -hmm. So when you put out content, you can put out whatever content you want that's unique to your group, but use mm -hmm. common keywords so we then impact search. So people then discover more of our content more easily when they go on Google, right? So that, that's one thing. The other thing is I would do an analysis of who do people actually listen to mm -hmm. related to anti-Semitism. So unfortunately for a lot of people, it's not who we think it might be. It may not be people in government. It may not be regional yeah. reporters. You know, it may be people who are just in think tanks or, or thought leaders or they could be rabbis or they could be, who knows? But the key thing is the market already knows. Mm -hmm. and, and so when you do analysis, you see who's already there as a leader. And then it's our job to go work with them to amplify their voice. Mm -hmm. You know, if you think about it, like, um, let's take, uh, let's say we're in Ukraine. I, I love Ukraine. I'm actually part Ukrainian. And, um, you know, when I look at their, their struggles to become a country, the, you don't go against the Putin-influenced Russian content that goes through the oligarchs media outlets and hope that you can outdo them. Yeah. You say, who are the emerging voices? Mm -hmm. Like who are the people who, who are saying the right thing, who are fighting for their country? How do we help them build their brand? How do we help them build their audience? Mm -hmm. How do we turn them into the stars of tomorrow? Versus, hey, I have a great idea. Let's do another campaign and just push it out. Yeah. Not gonna work. Yeah. We've, we've got to like build the ecosystem ourselves. So we're totally capable of doing it, but it's, um, Again, it's a, it's a mindset shift from the old days of, let's just do an advertising campaign. Everything will be great. <laughs> like, not really. Right, right, right. We have to be a lot more deliberate about it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. What do you consider reliable sources of information? I, I tend to um, zero in on, on well, it, it's an interesting two things. I, I zero in on people. Mm -hmm. So there's individual people. Uh, like so if like a D david brooks is writing something for the new york times mm -hmm. i'm going to read it yeah but if holman jenkins in the wall street journal is writing something i'm also going to read it and, and what i find and what i tell this all the time is 
you have to be, if, if you really want to learn, you have to be pushing yourself on alternative sources. Mm. So mm -hmm. if you read the New York Times, read the Wall Street Journal. You know, if you believe that uh, companies are doing amazing things for the environment, also read what Greenpeace has to say. You know, and mm -hmm. so if you, you know, if you think that Iran is uh, doing bad things, try to learn about Iran at the same time. Yeah. And, you know, maybe, maybe read the Quran or something, you know, but I mean, do, do yeah. something, right? Yeah. So you, you start to, you, you build sensitivities in both places. And I found that the best way to learn is to do that. And the, the reason I started doing that a long time ago is I was working internationally since my early 20s. And, and so if I'm going to go into Korea for the first time, I'm like, gosh, I don't know anything about Korea. So what do you do? You read the history of Korea. Yeah. And, and you read about it. Before you know it, you can understand why people have certain customs. Mm. And, and you're yeah. inside their heads. And you're like, okay, I know how to align with it. You know? And, and the same with Japan, the same with China, the same, you know. So we, do, we have to do the same thing with sources of information. Like, like it's like take QAnon. I, I think that's a terrible group. Right? I don't even understand this. It's just terrible. I mean, I'm completely against all that stuff. Yeah, yeah. But you have to like poke your head in it to look at it to say, what are they doing? Like, right. what are they doing that might be working? And then how could we actually then outsmart them and basically um, go, the other, get, go the other direction? Not any different than if someone's anti-Semitic. What do they do? What are their techniques? Mm -hmm. Got it. Okay, now now we understand how to uh, neutralize or minimize their impact. How do we identify disinformation? What are the telltale signs? I, I'm a big believer in using data science. So uh, so one of the things you can see with data science is you can see bot networks moving content like that because mm -hmm. machines work in a very linear way. So we're and if you don't, if people don't think about it, they go, oh my gosh, you know, bot networks, what are we going to do? Mm -hmm. When you're looking at them, they are just moving content in a linear way, engaging with it, moving it. And so you can see them. So that we should be able to see them much faster than we do. And that, mm -hmm. that's important. I think the second thing is um, you can see people's patterns and behaviors. So one of the things that yeah. I still want to, we will do, is we're in the process of thinking through what we call a bad actor library. Mm -hmm. Because mm -hmm. there aren't that many bad actors in the world. Let's say there's a, let's, say, let's, let's just make up a number and say there's a couple hundred thousand. That's a tiny data point in today's world. So right. anyone who has a public uh, face like that, you basically index them and you look at how they act with each other. And then you can start to see how does cells work with each other? Uh, mm -hmm. What mm -hmm. kind of data they usually go out? How, what's the duration of their, uh, disinformation campaign, which countries tend to start them and which ones don't, you know? And so yeah. all these answers are in front of us if we, mm. if we actually index the bad actors in the world. So I, I do believe, uh, we'll do, we're going to do it ourselves, but I, I believe that that could be something that many uh, groups could do. Mm. Tell us about deep fakes. Deep, yeah. So it's the way I like to look at it, Mark is, uh, if Hollywood can do it, bad actors can do it, right? That's, that's the way I like to start. <laughs> right. So when we say like, oh, deep right. fakes, you know, you can make someone's face uh, say something that they didn't say, or you mm. can compress voice. You can change text. Absolutely right. You know, it's uh, becoming almost unlimited what you can do. Yeah. So, so when I think of deep fakes, I think of that, that's gotten people's attention, which is great. Mm -hmm. But if you think of what's next, it's like you can do billions of images. So I could say, okay, this is what I look like today. Let's say I'm, I'm not a bad actor, but let's say I was. I now know you're onto me. I'm just going to do another image, another image, another image, another yeah. image. And this is why we need to build a bad actor library. Because the, what I will do, because I'm human, is I would probably follow a pattern of likenesses that I would pick. Yeah. So if you start to yeah. see over time, you'd say, oh, there's a pattern. That's Pearson. That's mm -hmm. positive, you know. So, uh, right. so we'll be doing it there, but we'll also be doing it with uh, audio, and uh, mm -hmm. you can compress your voice. And you know, people could be downloading this right now, and come out with a different version. And you and I would both say we didn't say that, mm -hmm. but but they have enough of a voice that they're able to compress it. You know, or you know, just things like uh, the thing that scares me the most, and we talk about this when we or teach together, is mm -hmm. you can change like one thing. You know, use natural language processing 
and you could be putting out news every day and just change one little fact every yeah. time. So we have to be better at anomaly filters. Mm -hmm. So if you see something that is not normal, it gets flagged right away. Yeah. So you know, this is ultimately what Facebook and others are trying to do. And I think mm -hmm. they're, they're struggling to get to the right place. Um, yeah. Yeah. But none of it's rocket science. It's all, it's all stuff that we can pull up. Tell us a little bit more about what social media platforms are doing. You just mentioned it, like Facebook and Google and even YouTube. They've been trying to identify and shut down disinformation channels. Tell us yeah. a little bit about what they're doing and should they be doing so? Yeah, it's, uh, well, that's, that's, that's the last part is the interesting part. So, <laughs> right, right. So I think, you know, in general, I think that they are doing a lot and I think they're trying really hard and uh, this is a problem that is going to get worse, not better, because mm -hmm. it's easier to do. So it's not really fair to think that they're going to solve it. That's, that's a mistake that we're making. To think right, that Google right. and Facebook and Twitter are going to solve this, that's, that's never going to happen. Yeah. Uh, what we have to, I think, look back on is to say, okay, what's, what's really going on here? Um, our, our security as a country, let's, let's think of the United States. Mm -hmm. We're basically outsourcing our security to Mark Zuckerberg and you know, Google and uh, you know, the, the Twitter folks and saying, hey, guys, uh, good luck. Hope you, make, hope you get it right. That makes no sense. We should be saying, when you identify bad actors, put them in a data lake, allow us to access them, we'll pay you for it. And we can see patterns across channels. Because mm -hmm. bad actors know how to smoke Google and, and Twitter and others. They do it all the time. And they work cross-platform. So if you can't see that information in real time cross-platform, then you're always going to be behind them. And that, that's, that's an issue. So I think, you know, that's the other thing is um, they won't make the case they're not media companies. I, I don't know how they get away with that. <laughs> and I can't believe that the folks who question them in Congress uh, can't figure that out. It, when you build an algorithm, right. where you build a machine learning training set, or an AI tool, it's a human being that's doing it. Mm -hmm. So human beings are deciding how they weight things, which means that they're injecting bias. Right. So, which is not any different than an editor of a newspaper deciding which articles are on the front page and the back page and which ones never get in. Right. Right. So, that's a media company. Now, I don't I want agree. them to be regulated by the FCC more. I would agree. But, um, I don't think anyone wants that if they don't, they don't have to be. But right. that means that they have to start to play ball in a much more pro proactive way with the uh, public sector. It, you know, it really sounds like, you know, give, given the problem of misinformation and disinformation, its pervasiveness in, in our information space, the larger companies, government organizations trying to catch up, it really seems as though, and it, it's obvious to me that we as individuals have to really put on our filters to really kind of weed out uh, information for ourselves. From your perspective, how do we think critically about information that's presented to us? And what kind of questions do we need to ask as we confront information of any kind? Yeah, we're, there's two things on there. One is, um, you're getting at, a, I think, a really important point, which is it's time for the private sector to take this seriously. And I say this when I go out and speak is, you know, we have this, we have what we call corporate social responsibility. And that has been, let's recycle, let's improve the environment, let's do things for our sure. community. Well, this is our community, our country, our communities, our citizens, our children. Yeah. They're all being impacted by this. Yeah. And so I think if the public sector starts to treat this like something that they can actually do something about, we actually will start improving education and uh, we'll get better at this. Yeah. But in the meantime, I, I look at, I always like to look at like strategic filters. So, mm -hmm. you know, I think if people ask themselves simple questions like, do I actually ever look at alternative sources of information or do I only look at one screen? If, you, if that's a check of, no, I don't actually do that. Okay, that's a problem. You know, then the second thing is ask yourself the critical question, um, who influences me? Mm -hmm. And uh, I do ask this, by the way, of people, and I'm uh, unfortunately disappointed to see most people not know the answer to that, right? So then, yeah. okay. And yeah. then number three, you know, would be um, where could you go to learn more? Mm -hmm. Like what's a new channel to open your mind, right? So really the first and the third are related. But if you just get people to say, 
Where do I get information today? And who influences me? You can get people to open their minds. I think that if we uh, make it too complicated and say, yeah. here's a 10 point training program and all that, I mean, then everyone's like, ah, you know, and then they, they don't do it. Right? <laughs> They're gonna happen, right. Yeah, we just need people to say, like, it's almost like saying, you know, you weigh too much, you might want to eat less. Right. Right. Or, uh, hey, you don't look as good as you could, maybe you should go to the gym, right? Mm -hmm. Like these are things like, I could do something. It's like, okay, what are you reading or consuming? Mm -hmm. who, you, who do you trust? Right. Same, same kind of thing. And, and I think that helps people in the most simple way. And it's, it's just so commonsensical what you're saying. <laughs> right. Right. But it's, common sense is in short supply usually. Well, yeah. and, and what, I think what I'm finding, especially in this day and age, is that to have a common sense perspective is actually kind of controversial. Yes, it, it is. And it's, uh, but that's, you know, that, that gets back to what I was just saying, because if you are old, this doesn't matter which side you're on, for example, in the uh, election we're having. Right. If you're only consuming stuff from one side, of course you're going to be more polarized. And, and I think this is where we are, we're just, I don't know, it's, I think that we have to almost cycle out of that. That's a little bit of fatigue. Yeah, right. You know, we just have to eventually say we want something better. So I'm not sure I have the answer to that, Mark. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Right. I have a bit of a sensitive question for sure. you, and it's, a, and it's a, an important one. Do we live in a free society? Yeah, that's, a, that's an interesting question. Um, when you look at like the Freedom Watch looks at, they look at, uh, I think when we talk about freedom, I like the way they approach it where it, there's a basket of freedoms, mm -hmm. many different types of freedoms, you know. And so um, net freedoms have decreased consistently over the last, say, decade wow. worldwide. Wow. So I think they, the way they count it, and you know, I'm sure people could challenge it, but at 113 of the 190 countries in the United Nations see a net decrease in freedoms over the last decade. So do we, when we say, do we have more or less freedom? I look at it more and say, I look at the world. It's okay, if the world is becoming less free in terms of free speech and ability to not be censored and things like that, that is creating problems that will have a much longer effect on all of us. So we might be as free as the day is long, but if the rest of the world is going the wrong direction, not good. Right. You know? and, and in there, like one of the things that I am, uh, censorship is one of the areas where I'm becoming obsessed with. Yeah. Uh, there's areas where I, new areas where I tend to just get really obsessed. And um, with, what is hitting me with censorship is technology is so good now that you can actually censor people without them knowing it. Right, because wow. we think of censorship as like, you know, there's an iron wall, can't get out. There's right. a Berlin wall, can't get out. It, I mean, but really, it's just decreasing people's reach. It's uh, deleting people's accounts quietly. It, it, there's so many ways that you can create mischief now with censorship. So, so that's the concern I see is that the freedom is decreasing net, net-wise worldwide. Given all that is happening now, what do you see? For our future how do you see all of the current trends and things like that how, you know how, how is that going to play out and is there a way to course correct there is and I, this is where i get very optimistic so i mean mm -hmm. there's very few bad actors in the world when you really look at it hmm. there's 7.7 .7 billion of us and yeah. so if we decide to do something we, we can have a great outcome and hmm. so i think you know if i think of like uh, governments in general yeah in governments uh, the more that they learn how to work with each other and not worry about their divisions or departments, mm -hmm. but just think of how do I actually impact this uh, battling disinformation that yeah. works. The, the quicker that the private sector realizes is that this is now an issue that affects everything. Like I said, you know, country, children, communities, mm -hmm. you know, all that, you start to, we start to make an improvement there. Yeah. And if we do that, we have the full capability of um, combating disinfo. The other thing I think is we have to become less adversarial with our own companies. And so, you know, like uh, Google is an amazing company, you know, I mean, Twitter serves a purpose. Mm -hmm. Let's have a discussion with them about how to solve problems rather than talk at them. Right. And, right. And so I, I, no, I think I'm, if we decide to do it and do it constructively, we will make a great impact. Mm -hmm. 
you're currently working with a major department of the US government. What kind of advice are you giving them in terms of countering and undermining disinformation? Well, the main thing, like, you know, there's a couple places that I um, uh, give my time and mm -hmm. um, with the Global Engagement Center, one of the things I really like is there's something called disinfocloud.com. So anyone listening to this could go there and, and you can see all the technologies that have been tested that are related to combating disinfo. I think that's extremely valuable because part of what we need to do is actually allow the private sector and other countries to, to see what's working. Yeah. We're not working and also add to it. So I think getting um, private sector know-how mm -hmm. in, in the hands of the public sector is one of the best things we can do. There's, there's, I always say this, I mean, there's so many smart people in the public sector. Like that's, we don't have an issue of intelligence. We have an issue of access to the latest innovation that we can then apply. Yeah. You know, yeah. so that's, that's uh, one of the things that I, I spend a lot of time on is, uh, I guess you would call it tech transfer. Is there anything that we as individuals can do to counter or undermine the impact of disinformation or misinformation? Yeah, that's a good, that's a good question. I think, uh, at the fundamental level, you know, we all engage in bias. This is actually something I've written about before. So, because you can seem overwhelming and you say, well, I can't go against Russia, I'm just an individual. Right. It's like, no, you can be nice to people on Facebook. You can actually think twice about what you just said in a comment on Twitter. You can actually, um, you can actually be the, a lot of times people are really great people in, in person. And right. then you put them in a digital environment, for some reason, this other side of that comes off. Turn it off, right? And when you see your friends doing it, ask them to stop. Right. You know. So imagine if we all just did that, we would, we would, man, would we decrease the volume? Wow. Right? Yeah. So we do. We really all can do something. So I want to ask some general advice and lessons learned questions. If you could share one secret of your success, what would that be? Yeah. It's um. I've I've had the opportunity to work. Um, closely with several CEOs yeah. and uh, Dan Vesela, who was the CEO of Novartis mm -hmm. and Michael Dell, which we, we know runs Dell Technologies. Right. And when you around people like that, who are just brilliant, you say, okay, what is it that they do well? Mark Benahoff is another one, salesforce.com. Yeah. And I find that they're like, they're incremental innovators. Like, and really Steve Jobs was an incremental innovator when you really break it apart. Mm -hmm. They, every single interaction they have, they think, how do I make something better? And if something isn't working, okay, how do I stop doing it as fast as possible and then go on to the next thing? So it's not emotional. It's just, uh, how do you do it? Now I translate that into my life of every media model, everything we do in digital media is old school. How do you, how do you improve it? What's next? Yeah. And, then, and if you keep thinking like that every day, you, you make a lot of progress, but it's, but it's like all the time. That's what the most innovative people do. So that's what I've learned is, um, you know, it's not an aha breakthrough and then you're done. Right. It's actually the grind of always trying to be better. What's the greatest lesson you've learned either in life or in business? I, I would say it's, I've learned early in my career what we do matters and, and has the potential to save lives yeah. in many cases. And so when I worked in the pharmaceutical industry, you, I got to talk with people, unfortunately dying of Lou Gehrig's disease, mm. colorectal cancer, um, and, and they were the most hopeful people wow. who were really hoping that we would come out with a treatment quicker that might impact, maybe not them, because they knew that they were gonna die, but yeah. maybe the next group of people. And that kind of urgency to say, if we do the right things, we actually make society better, or can. Yeah. Is, that, that's, I think, the biggest thing, and I think, when, when you're in the public sector, you're in the public sector for a reason. It's yeah. because you, you want to give back and make society better. Right. You, know, you want to make the world better. I think when you're in industries like that, you like pharmaceuticals or healthcare, you're in there because you want to make things better. And, I, and I, when people don't have that urgency, that's when I'm concerned, mm. right? Because we do have that ability to improve the world. And, and we also can't wait till tomorrow. Mm. You know, it's stuff we, it's like, what can we do today? Mm -hmm. And I think if you have that yeah. uh, kind of urgency, then that's, that's a good thing. That's awesome. I, I love what you just said. If, if you do the right things, 
we make society better. <laughs> right, right, every day. It's just every day, every day. And don't wait. Don't wait to do the right thing. No, there's nothing like I'm going to do it when I retire or, you know, it's like, no, it's like, what are you going to do today? Right. You know? right. right. If you could offer one piece of advice to the world, what would it be? The piece of advice I would have would be, uh, we're, we're all the same. We, we are, if you look at DNA, we're humans are humans. We may, we may look different to each other, but we're all the same. Yeah. And if we can learn how to um, protect each other, and help each other, we can actually make a big difference. And, and the example I give is related to what we're talking about today, Mark, is most of the world is very young. Yeah. And, and our habits and memories are get, get drilled into our brains for the rest of our lives between like birth and age 25. So imagine if we just all figured out, like how do we help the youth in the world, wherever they are, have the best experience possible so they become the best citizens of tomorrow. Yeah. That'd be awesome. <laughs> yeah. Okay? But that means, you know, if you're helping a kid on a Saturday learn math, you're doing something great. If yeah. you're doing something in the community, you're doing something great. Like that's, it's, it's all these little things that add up. But if we're all doing it, we're all trying to do it. We, I mean, it's, it's no problem. But as you know, we don't, because we make excuses. We say, oh, I can't do it, I'm busy, you know, or right. do it next time. But the urgency is there for that. And that, I think we're, I think that would be cool. What do you want most for your life? Um, I always look at it in terms of the, um, the people that I've impacted, you know, whether it's actually um, working in industry, building, building teams or building firms. Mm -hmm. I actually don't really, I don't know that I care that much about myself. You know, we, we have our time when we go. It's did I, how many lives did I impact? Yeah. And, and if I can, if I can think that I've, and I keep going in that direction, then uh, I'm happy. Yeah. But if it ever, you know, just became about me, I would be sad, you know, because that's, we're just, all of us, we're just one person, right? right? We can impact so many other folks. So that's, that's it. And it's really, I've thought about that a lot over the decades of, you know, yeah. been alive and it's not more complicated than that. <laughs> right. Right? right. It's not like, gosh, if we could only get that boat. You know, right. you know, it's not about that at all. It's about impacting other people's lives. Well, I can, I can definitely say you've, you've impacted my life in the time that I've known you in, in a meaningful way. Thank um, you, Mark. To the, to the degree that I, that I said, I want to talk with Bob Moore <laughs> and really pick his brain. And I think that maybe, maybe we could do something together. You know, we, right. <laughs> we can have some impact and influence together, you know, for, you know. Here we are. Yeah, yeah, yeah. At, at this point, I want to open it up for you to share any thoughts, any final thoughts with us. You know, is there anything that I haven't asked you that you think would be really helpful for us to know? Yeah, I think, you know, you mentioned um, a lot of things, but I mean, uh, I'll just do a couple. One is you mentioned the book Crafting Persuasion at the beginning, you know, that I, I co-wrote with, with Kip Knight and Ed Tazia. And it was really a reflection of many other uh, professors who teach in government over the years and we kind of co collapsed all of our thinking into one. The ability to tell our story powerfully matters. Yeah. So as we, as we think of this topic, it's not about just putting stuff out. It's about yeah. really, like I said, thinking about the audience, but it's also thinking about what is that narrative that's going to align with the audience. Mm -hmm. So if, if everyone who's in the business of sharing our, our country's story, or company's story, things like that, we do a lot better. Yeah. I think the other thing is everyone needs to have analytics in their life. Mm -hmm. That's my view, because it's so quantitative out there with, with watching how humans interact in any way worldwide, mm -hmm. that the more quantitative we get, the better qualitatively we can be. Mm -hmm. So if you think about it, like, right. let's, say you're gonna, let's say you and I were creative directors at an advertising agency. If we have all this analytics, we're gonna build better campaigns, you know? But if we're actually telling the story of America somewhere and we have better analytics, we're going to align with the audience we're trying to reach in Kazakhstan, right? Like we're going to like, I mean, it just, it comes together. So that's a, that's another. And then I think being a continual learning is that the, the other last point I'd like to make. And when I, when I um, talk to groups in you know, private industry, one of the things I say is you never stop being a student. And so then I ask, um, what are you reading to stretch yourself? And, and some people have answers, but many, they're reading the same books that everyone else is reading. Yeah. And so what I'll say to them is, why don't you read a book on Chernobyl 
or read a book on the history of China or read a book on artificial intelligence and like get out of your comfort zone yeah. and, and stretch yourself Great. instead of reading every single business book that comes out and then you say the exact words that everyone else says. Right. Like that's, that hurting behavior doesn't make us smarter. Where can people find you and connect with you online? Most of the uh, posts I do, I, I put on LinkedIn. So people are welcome to uh, go in there. And it's just my name, Bob Pearson. So that's easy. And then on Twitter, it's uh, at Bob Pearson 1845. And the 1845, just so you know, it's, uh, that's been Texas joining the United States. So I yeah, <laughs> couldn't resist from putting that on there. Right. Beautiful. Yeah. <laughs> Spoken like a true Texan. That's right. All. <laughs> yeah, and Mark, you know, I, I, I mentioned to you I was going to try to work this in here, but Please. you know, in the spirit of what we were talking about with uh, combating disinfo, the um, piece of artwork behind me is actually of Jerusalem, yeah, and it's from a Jordanian, an emerging uh, female artist in Jordan, uh, Dalia Ali, and we bought it from a couple that's English and Arabic, yeah, um, that are um, in the Jewish quarter. So we just, there were just so many things in there where you're like, this is what it's about, right? Gorgeous. So, yeah. It, it, the picture is gorgeous and the, and the story around it is, is even better, actually. <laughs> That's beautiful. Bob, you completely, as always, far exceeded my expectations. Thank you so much for taking the time with me. Uh, it, it, brilliant, brilliant um, insights and wisdom. And I can't wait to share this with everybody. And I have a feeling that we're going to be talking more in the future. So. <laughs> no, that's great. And Mark, thank you for, I thank you for, for doing this series. I think it's important that we take the time to talk about things like this. It's great that you're doing this on a regular basis. Thank you. Thank you, Bob.